Communication in our daily lives is very important, not only for ourselves, but also for the cells that make up our bodies. Have you ever wondered how our bodies know what to do? How does our body know when we are tired? How does our body know when we are hungry? The answer for this is that our cells communicate with one another in order to do their jobs. Cellular communication is vital for cells to work together in order for our bodies to carry out necessary biological functions. Before we jump into the video, let's define a few key components of cell signaling. A ligand is a signaling molecule that binds with another complex for a biological purpose. A receptor is a protein that is able to receive stimulus in order to produce a signal. Often, this signal is a ligand that binds specifically to a certain receptor. Sending cells are the cells that release the signals, while target cells are the cells that contain the receptor and receive the signal. Non-target cells do not contain the receptor for the specific ligand. There are three main types of cellular signaling. Autocrine signaling occurs when the cell secretes a ligand that affects the same cell. Paracrine signaling occurs when the cell secretes a ligand that affects neighboring cells. And lastly, endocrine signaling is when the cells secrete a hormone and affects cells over a long distance, typically traveling through the bloodstream. For the purpose of this video, we will be focusing on cell signaling within the endocrine system. There are three main components of cellular signaling. The first is reception, and this occurs when the ligand or signaling molecule binds to its receptor. It does so by binding to an active site that is specific for that ligand. Receptors are typically bound to the cell membrane, but can also be within the cell itself. The next step is signal transduction. Once the ligand binds to the receptor, a conformational change occurs in the receptor and this triggers a cascade of events that will occur. This could be the release of a secondary messenger or a conformational change that will recruit other proteins to bind. Eventually, once our signal is passed on, we finally get our response, which is the desired outcome of the ligand binding to the receptor in the first place. This could be something like increasing the transcription of a certain protein or influence other cellular processes such as cell division. The endocrine system is a series of glands that produce and secrete hormones that the body uses for a wide range of functions. These hormones are guided to the target cell's receptors, which in the case of the endocrine system are usually located on the cell surface. The endocrine system allows for long distance signaling, reaching cells that are far away from where the hormone was initially re released from. This is done via the bloodstream as the hormones diffuse into the capillary beds and enter the circulatory system. When the hormones reach the target cell, the hormones then diffuse out from the target's capillary bed and interact with the cell's receptors allowing for the desired response to occur. A lot of these chemical cascades aim to achieve one thing and that is homeostasis. A state of homeostasis is when there is a constant environment within the body. This is important because a lot of biological processes that keep us alive require that we be in a constant state, such as body temperature. The nervous system aims to attend to homeostasis rapidly. It can receive a stimulus, understand the received information, and then send out instructions on how to deal with the stimulus within fractions of a second. In contrast, the endocrine system needs more time to make changes, but these changes are longer lasting. This longer lasting change is beneficial for long-term growth, body development, and metabolism. The slower reaction rates also give time for the body to adapt to the changes the hormones aim to make, ensuring that no physiological stress is experienced by the body. This is not to say that the endocrine system and the reaction rates of the hormones are slow, as peptides and catecholamines react relatively fast when administered to the body. The more important feature of the endocrine system is that it is longer lasting. Since the hormones remain in the bloodstream longer, it saves energy and resources as the body does not need to make a lot of hormones to send to the target cell. Now that we understand how the endocrine system can use hormones to achieve an output or goal, how does it know when to stop the process to not waste resources or go too far? Negative feedback loops are the main player to regulate these processes. They ensure that the process stops when homeostasis is achieved. This is done by the end product of a chemical cascade being used as the inhibitor to the initial input so the process slows down and eventually stops when the achieved concentration of end product is made. This makes this process self-regulating without the use of another process to stop it. Cell signaling in the endocrine system all follow similar processes. 
Let's dive into a specific example to take a closer look at the mechanisms involved. Insulin is a hormone that is produced by beta cells in the pancreas and is released when there is increased glucose into the bloodstream. The function of insulin is to promote the absorption of glucose into the liver, adipocytes, and skeletal muscle cells where it is stored. Once insulin is released into the bloodstream, it travels to its target cell. In this case, we are looking at a skeletal muscle cell. Insulin then binds to the insulin receptor that is present in the cell membrane. The beta subunits of the receptor are activated by the insulin binding and they phosphorylate proteins inside of the cell known as the insulin receptor substrates. These proteins activate a signal transduction cascade that leads to the activation of other proteins and transcription factors that mediate the intracellular response of insulin. Eventually, this leads to the response where GLUT4 glucose transporters are inserted into the cell membrane and glucose can now enter the cell to be used or to be stored. As mentioned earlier, many hormones have negative feedback loops that regulate them. Another hormone called glucagon works to counteract the effects of insulin. When blood glucose levels are too low, glucagon exerts its effects by increasing blood glucose levels through the breakdown of glycogen, which is the storage form of glucose, into glucose. Understanding cellular signaling also allows us to further understand the mechanisms of disease. Type 1 diabetes mellitus is an autoimmune disease that causes the destruction of pancreatic beta cells, leading to severely decreased insulin levels. Ultimately, this causes an increase in blood glucose levels and is detrimental to human health. Treating this disease requires daily injections of insulin to maintain blood glucose levels. This was just one example of an endocrine process, but there are many more such as with growth hormones, vasopressin, thyroid hormones, and the list goes on. Each of these hormones have their own end goals, but all use the same method of transportation, so the endocrine system is crucial for the body. Understanding the mechanisms of how these signaling pathways work helps us to create new therapies in treating disease.